Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians from the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 33b. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only ones it has reached? This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is one of those days in which the scripture is read, and if we had said this is the word of God, it would have left many people a little queasy. <laughs> this is one of those passages we find in the Bible that many in the church, many churches, don't want to have to deal with or even admit are there. So, for example, this passage is not included in the lectionary readings. Those are the readings put together on a three-year cycle by the Roman Catholic Church and several Protestant denominations that recommend scripture passages for each Sunday of the year. This passage is not found in those readings. But we don't have to go very far to find churches that still use this passage, not only to deny women leadership positions in the church, but most importantly to deny women ordination, become ministers. The girls and I were recently at the famous Irish restaurant McDonald's. <clears throat> and the, the guy in the next booth was talking on his cell phone about this travesty of a question that was about to come up at his church's general conference this summer. And the travesty was they were going to consider allowing women to become ordained clergy. And for this man, this was an abomination in the eyes of God. Not only is it violating scripture, but Lucifer himself, he said, was behind this to try and bring down the church. Now, based on what he was, able, was saying, I went home and did a Google search and found out that he had to have been a member of the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, the great irony is that the Seventh-day Adventists were co-founded by a woman. But they're arguing of whether what leadership role women should have in the church. So although we in the mainline churches don't talk about these passages very often, I think we ignore them in our own peril, and we ignore them at the peril of the greater church as well. So today we begin a new sermon series looking at stories of some of the women in the Bible, but we're going to begin with dealing with some of these difficult passages we find about how women are supposed to be involved in the church. And today is going to be a little different than what I normally try and do in a sermon. First, this is going to be a two-part sermon series, or two-part sermon. There's today and then there's next week. So if you miss one of those, you'll be missing a portion of what I have to say just because there's too much to try and cover all in one. Although when we get to the end, you might be able to say, yeah, you should have cut most of that out. <clears throat> but today is not going to be one of those where we're going to have some life application of how this applies to our lives, what we can find in this scripture, if you want some uplifting stories and figuring out how does God working for me this week, come back next week. That's when we'll talk about this week, about, about that. Today, I'm going to give you some background, some perspective of how we look at these passages, how we might interpret them in a different way. So a good place to start is with the understanding is that there are going to be things in Scripture with which we are going to disagree. Whether you are conservative or liberal or somewhere in the middle, if you don't find something in Scripture that you just find troubling or repulsive, you're not reading Scripture enough, because there are plenty of things in Scripture that are just difficult to try and grapple with. So, and the second part is to understand that the lens through which we read Scripture has just as much importance as the words on the page do. So, for example, if we were reading passages about slavery, 
just 200 years ago, we would read them radically different than we do today. Our perspective on slavery has changed. Our perspective on Scripture has changed. In just 200 years, we've made a radical shift. I know no one today who is arguing that the slavery that still takes place is okay because it's justified in Scripture. We just don't make that argument anymore. Now, I think that Paul is one of the great misunderstood people in the history of the church. And a lot of that has to do with how Paul's words or his reported words have been used throughout the history of the church to suppress and to hurt people. Adam Hamilton, pastor of the largest Methodist church in America, recounted a story. He was walking down the hallway and a young girl stopped him and said, what are you going to be preaching on this Sunday? And he said, I'm going to be talking about Paul. And she said, ah. He said, well, what's wrong with Paul? She said, he's such a misogynist. That's a statement, as I began my journey to the ministry, I would have agreed with. But the more I read Paul, and the more I come to understand what I think Paul is saying in his letters, the more I see Paul not as someone who supported the status quo, but that, that, not that he was not a man of his own time, because he was, but somebody who actually was purporting a radical understanding of the gospel message and the freedom that we received in Christ. But over the last 2,000 years, we've sort of boxed in and contained and controlled Paul's message, and we've lost the radicality of what he was actually preaching. So with that in mind, as we look at that passage from 1 Corinthians, there are some scholars who believe that that passage is not original to Paul, that it was added in later by scribes. This is called an interpolation, one of my $60,000 words, known to justify my seminary education. And what it simply means is that a later text is added into an earlier text. So if you were reading along in the bulletin this morning, you would have seen that that passage is actually found in parentheses. And that's because the translators of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible do not believe it's authentic, or at least not authentic to the place that we find it in Scripture today. They also don't have enough evidence to remove it, and so they give indication marks, in this sense, uh, parentheses, in order to set it out as different from the rest of the scripture we find around it. Now, you may be asking, how is it that translators try to decide whether something is authentic or not? And I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the first thing to know about the New Testament is it, it was not written in English. Jesus didn't speak English, regardless of what you might sometimes hear. It's all written in Greek. The second thing is that we have not just one manuscript. When they're going to look at a translation, they don't just have one manuscript that's in front of them, and they just make a translation out of the Greek into the English. We have thousands of manuscripts available to us, some the size, a little blurb out of a former manuscript, the size of a business card, some complete works, some that are nearly the complete um, entirety of the New Testament. Now, the good news is that we have the most access to the most and the best manuscripts that we have had since the earliest days of the church. So our translations are far superior to what we've seen throughout the, the millennia. The bad news is that these manuscripts don't match each other. So there, where there are differences, scholars and translators have to try and decide what they think is original to the text, what was originally written down by the author who wrote these letters or books. Now, for most of Scripture, there's not really any major problems. There are some word differences, some phrasing differences, and good translations will give you footnotes on that, and they'll say different manuscript traditions say this. So you can see what's sort of been going on, but they make their best guess as to what they think is original. But there are major discrepancies in some places in which some manuscripts will contain a story that are not found in other manuscripts. Or they'll find stories that are found in different places in the manuscripts than are found in other places in the story. So one of the things they then have to decide is whether they think the passage is original or not, and where it may have originally been found in the manuscript. And one of the ways they do that is to look and say, if you took that passage out, would the passages around it make more sense, or would they make less sense? Would it be easier or harder to read 
if that passage wasn't there. The second thing that they look at is whether the passage matches the rest of the documents, or if this is writings by, like, say, Paul, who has multiple writings we find in Scripture. Does it match things that Paul is saying in other places? Or does it seem out of place with what we find elsewhere? And then there's also the question of where it might have originally laid. Now, the problem is, is by the standards that scholars use, the passage we heard from 1 Corinthians this morning fails on every account. The first problem is the passage is not found in all the manuscripts at verse 33b, which is where we see it, some it's found after verse 40. So when translators find this occurring, they again try to think whether this is original to the text or whether it's been added in at some later time. And if it is original, where did it originally occur in the text? In this particular instance, many scholars believe that this came into the, the tradition, the manuscript tradition, as a margin notation by a scribe at some point. Now, just because it's a margin notation doesn't mean it's not original, because what the scribes would do is they'd have the manuscript in front of them, and they would be then transcribing it onto another piece of paper. And that's hard work. If you don't believe and think that you can do it without making mistakes, go home this afternoon and try. Take a page of the Bible and try to transcribe it directly, word for word, and you're going to find you make mistakes. And so sometimes the scribes would skip over lines. And hopefully they would find that they skipped lines, and they would go back in. Paper is really expensive. They can't just wad it up and throw it over and start over again. They would make a margin notation with the lines that they had missed. And then sc later scribes would have to figure out where does that go into the manuscript if they didn't make a notation of where it was actually supposed to exist originally. So just because it's a margin notation doesn't mean it's necessarily not original to the text. But what scholars believe that happened here is that a scribe was looking, transcribing what Paul is writing there, and he's writing about order in worship. And the scribe was thinking, what could be more disorderly in worship than a woman speaking? <laughs> and in particular, thinking about a passage we find in 1 Timothy that we'll, we'll look at next week. The main portion of it says, let a woman learn in silence and full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silence. So what scholars speculate is that some scribe is reading this passage from Paul and thinking, He's obviously referencing this passage from 1 Timothy and made a reference notation to it. Later scribes then came back to this manuscript, weren't sure where it was going to go, and some put it at 33b and some put it at verse 40 because they didn't know where it originally went. So it's been added in, in two different places. The second point the translators look at is whether the passage again makes more sense with it in there or if you remove it, does it make more sense without it? So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to have your Bibles with you on Sunday morning. Pick one up as you come in. You can pay, turn to page 165. It'll also be up on the screen, although in much smaller type. And what you find is that Paul begins at verse 26 talking about prophecy and speaking in tongues in the church and order within the church. And one of the rules, he says, is that you can all prophesy. He makes no distinction based on gender, male or female. And everyone can prophesy in worship as long as they follow the order in worship. That is, that they're not causing a disruption. If you're causing a disruption, whether you're male or female, you need to be quiet. Because worship is primarily about the people. And then, so he's talking about prophesy, prophesying. And then he jumps into this passage on women not speaking. And then he goes back into talking about prophesying again. Now his call to prophesying matches something we find earlier in chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians in which Paul is talking about women praying and speaking in tongues and prophesying in church, which in chapter 11 Paul says is okay as long as they cover their heads. So it doesn't, looking sort of at the textual history of 1 Corinthians doesn't match what we're doing here. But worse is if you take out the ones in italics there, it says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. Anyone who claims to be a prophet or have spiritual powers must acknowledge that what I am writing to is a command of the Lord. So if we take out 33b through 36, the passage actually makes more sense 
without it there. It serves as an interruption in the middle of this passage. Now, it doesn't mean it's not authentic to Paul. It could be that it should be at verse 40, that it should start at uh, maybe verse 41. It should start a new thought there. The passage makes more sense without it sitting in there. So there's one other possibility that could be used to argue that the passage is, in fact, authentic to Paul. One of the biggest problems when we look at Greek manuscripts is that there's no punctuation. They're all capital letters, but there's normally not any breaks between words. It just all runs together. And so not only do translators have to figure out where the word breaks are, which is not always easy as you might think, but they have to figure out what the punctuation is. And there was no quotation marks used in the ancient world. And so for centuries, people believed that in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that he says that all things are lawful and also later that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what people thought that Paul was saying that. Most translations now, conservative and liter I mean, liberal translations, put those two remarks in quotes that they believe that Paul was responding to a letter that the Corinthians had sent them in which they were saying these things, and Paul is then responding to what they have said. He's not saying them himself. So that it's good for a man not to touch a woman is not Paul's words, they're Corinthian words that he is rebuking them for and giving special instruction on. So as I said, most translations now put these in quotes, and so some have proposed that we should actually put verses 34 and 35 in quotations, that this is something that the Corinthian community is saying to Paul, and then verse 36 is then Paul's response to it, which is sort of a rebuke. So if we want these words to be authentic to Paul, that might be a reasonable conclusion to make for several reasons. The first is that we know things like that were being said. In the Talmud, which is a collection of rabbinic writings, there's a statement that says, it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. Rabbi Eliezer, who is a contemporary of Paul, has recorded this saying, let the words of the law be burned rather than that they should be delivered by women. So if this is a quotation, then verse 36 serves as a rebuke of those two lines, possibly from the Corinthian community. And that makes more sense. Because traditionally it's sort of been seen as Paul is rebuking the women he's just told to be quiet. But if you're reading that passage, reading verse 36 that way doesn't make a lot of sense. But it does make sense if you put quotation marks around it that somebody else is saying and Paul is then rebuking them for making that statement. Now the final problem with this passage in its maybe authenticity to Paul is to understand it in relationship to what Paul says, not only in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, saying that women can prophesy and pray in church, but in what statements he makes in other letters as well. The one passage most people sort of hold up comes to us from Galatians, in which Paul says that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for we all are, are all one in Christ Jesus sort of holds on to that radicality of Paul, the egalitarianism that he lifts up and holds on throughout his letters about what happens when we accept Christ and what Christ has done for us. But the problem in sort of saying that's what we should hold on to is that there's not a hierarchy of Scripture. We say we're going to put Galatians 3.28 as the primary one and judge everything else against it. And if it doesn't match that, then it goes away. There's no difference in doing that than saying the passage from 1 Timothy is primary and saying women can't speak and anything that doesn't go against that goes away. There's not a hierarchy of Scripture that we can judge that against, certainly within Paul's writings. Instead, each passage needs to be taken within the context of where we find it, what's going on in the particular letter that Paul is writing, and then also then in the entirety of Paul's writings in this case, in order to hold on to the integrity of Scripture. Because if not, we're sort of doing violence to the text. We're picking and choosing what we want to hold on to and removing things. We can't do that when we approach Scripture, especially with one passages that we have difficulty in dealing with. So when we look at the entirety of Paul's writings, it would seem to indicate that Paul, in fact, does not have a problem with women participating in 
in worship and speaking in worship as long as they follow the rules and are orderly. The same thing he says about men. If you're speaking in tongues and there's no one there to interpret, shut up. You're disrupting worship. It's not about you. If you're there to prophesy, don't stand up and prophesy when someone else is speaking. You're disrupting worship. Whether you're a man or a woman, Paul is saying, there's certain order to what we're doing here. And what we find in Paul's writings, but not just Paul, many others, is that women played key roles in the early church. We'll hear some of their stories over these next few weeks. But in Paul's letter to the Romans, he references several women, including Phoebe, who he calls a deacon. We don't know what deacons did this early in the church, but it's clearly a position of authority within the church. He talks about Junia, who he says to be prominent among the apostles. Now, some translators, as the years went on, took Junia and they said, well, women can't be prominent among the apostles because they're not even allowed to speak in church. They can't hold leadership positions. And so they changed Junia, a female name, to Junius, a male name. Except that there was no male name, Junius, found anywhere else in any other manuscript from the first century. We don't even think the name existed. But they started with a preconceived idea that the woman couldn't hold this position, so therefore had to be a man. Now, I'm guessing you can assume what my position is on how we look at this passage, not only from what I just said, but from the fact that we have women in leadership positions. Beth was our speaker, our lay reader this morning. So, you know, we sort of say we're not going to deal with Paul in that way. But I would still say that we have to deal with this passage with integrity. Regardless of all the things that I just gave to you, we have to say, what if this is authentic to Paul? What if Paul actually did write that women should be silenced in the church? What does that mean for us today? Does it make the same difference in a 21st century context as it does in a 1st century context? And if not, how do we interpret? How can we interpret it differently for where we are now? And that's what we're going to look at next week, is how do we take these passages and apply them to our lives? What lens do we use so we can see God's Spirit moving and working in those passages? Now, clearly today's passage has impacted the church for 2,000 years, continues to impact the church today. So how do we approach Scripture with integrity? even the scriptures with which we disagree. Reading scripture is difficult. It's hard. But it can also be life-changing and life-giving. And when we shy away from those difficult texts, we short our faith, we short the witness. We short our ability to engage in conversation with people who hold different beliefs than we do. But when we also refuse to see Scripture as a living document that still speaks to us today, that God still speaks to us through Scripture, that Holy Spirit still allows us to interpret Scripture, that Jesus is still with us today, then we also do Scripture in our faith and in justice. So I hope that you'll be here next week when we deal more with how do we look at these passages and what is God saying to us? Why do we find them here in Scripture and acknowledge the wisdom and guidance that Scripture gives us, even those difficult, difficult passages as we encounter God's holy word. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen.